gamification and direct to chef skills. Hey, hello everybody. Um, that's my Twitter handle. You can follow me on Twitter. I'll leave it up there for a minute because my name is really hard to spell. Okay, so why do we even care about the game about the brain when we talk about gamification? So you may think, okay, science doesn't really have to do with uh, business and games and things like that. Well, the brain controls all of our behavior, and outside elements influence the brain and cause us to act in certain ways. So if you want to design experiences that have you know, the best chance of success in getting your audience to perform in a specific way, um, understanding a little bit about what the brain does is going to help you to do that. So let's back it up a little bit. What is gamification? Now, other people have also talked about this, so this should be no surprise at this point. Um, this should be like ingrained in you. Um, gamification is not just badges. Um, you may know this guy, Gabe Zuckerman. He says, the process of using game mechanics and game thinking to engage users to solve problems. So what we're talking about here, it's not just you know, turning something into a game. It's about changing behavior and ultimately about motivation. So. The question then is, so how do you get people motivated to change their behavior? What are some of the things that you may do? So let's say you're designing a program and you want, you want to get users engaged. You want to get your employees to do something. What are some of the things that you could throw at them? Some incentives or badges, um, perhaps giving them points for completing certain things, discounts on things that they buy, you know, free stuff. Who doesn't like free stuff, right? Um, a day with a supermodel, who knows? You know, it can be anything, anything that people like, so you're going to give them things that they like. And supposedly, giving people things they like is going to get them to want to change their behavior in a certain way, right? That's what we learned from um, behavioral psychology. You know, give a dog a treat, he's going to do what you want. But does that actually always work? If it always worked, you guys wouldn't be here because you wouldn't need to learn more about gamification. If all you had to do was throw badges on something um, and, and it got people to change their behavior, there would be nothing else to learn. Um, so sometimes when people tell me that they've, they've gamified their, their system or their treatment plan or whatever it is they're working on, I say, oh, yeah, really, what did you do? And they say, well, we added some badges. And I say, well, you badgified it. You didn't gamify it. So gamification is about, you know, motivating people to engage and change their behavior in ways that you want. So the question, the scientific question then is, is liking something the same as being motivated by it? So is pleasure the same as a behavior change? Is that always going to invoke a behavior change? And the answer is no. <laughs> the things that motivate a particular audience, cohort, or person may not be what you would expect. So I'm going to tell a little story about um, a client that I had several years ago um, working as a behavior therapist. And he had Asperger's, which some people considered to be um, high-functioning autism. And he was a brilliant kid. Uh, but when he was in school, his behavior was out of control. He would you know, hit other kids, cause disruption. And no matter what the teacher did, um, this, this behavior would continue and it was getting worse. So I, I took him on as a client and I met with his mom. And I had not, not even met the kid yet. I'm just talking to the mom. And I say, okay, so you know, what motivates him? So we want to get, you know, get a behavior plan going here. She's like, nothing motivates him. Absolutely nothing. We've tried everything. We've given the food that he likes. We've given him money, stickers, you know, time off, free time, anything. They, anything they could throw at him, and nothing was working. She's like, nothing motivates him. And so I, you know, I looked at her, and I said, you know, excuse me, but that's bullshit, okay? Everyone's motivated by something. You just haven't figured out what that is yet, so we're going to gamify it for us a little bit. You know, it's a little challenge, okay, to figure out what motivates this kid. So I spent a little time with him, and then after I got to know him a little bit, I went to observe him in school to see this behavior that everyone was talking about. So, and sure enough, they would, they would have to finish their work and then patiently wait for the next transition, and he would get done, and then all of a sudden he would start, you know, stabbing the kid with a pencil and all this stuff, and, and um, so the teacher's looking over at me. She's like, see, this is what I'm talking about. You know, his, his behavior is out of control. And so what I, what I noticed what happened was this kid had some sensory issues, first of all. So any high-pitched squealing, people getting really excited, big shifts in emotion, just absolutely um, just turned him off. He couldn't stand that. It just, you know, graded on his nerves. So he would do something good, and the teacher would be like, great job, you know, and she thinks she's, you know, incentivizing him. And in reality, it was actually sending him back the other way. So... What I figured out was that this kid was so smart, the only thing that he wanted to do at that point was get more work to do. He loved math. He loved solving problems. He loved just people leaving him alone, letting him do his thing. So the way we worked out was that he would finish his work. The teacher would just give a very non-emotional thumbs up. I recognize you did that thing. 
go ahead and move on to the next thing. She'd get more work to do. It worked out great for him. So the point of that story is if you're not spending the majority of your time in the beginning of every project identifying what motivates your audience, you are doing it wrong. And if I could make this slide huge in big shouty letters, I would do that. This is so important. I'm going to say it again. If you are not spending the majority of your time in the beginning of every project, treatment plan, employee incentive program, you know, if you're a company looking to market to a certain group, if you're not spending the majority of your time figuring out that audience, what motivates them in that context, you're, you're doing it wrong. You could, you could design the most beautiful game, incentive program, multifaceted, intricate, clever, you know, whatever you want to call it, and you, you bring it in front of your audience and it's not something that motivates them, it's not, it, you're wasting your time. You're going to have to start over because you're not going to get the behavior that you want. So let's talk about the science a little bit. Dopamine, one of my favorite molecules. It's actually on my necklace right in the center. So what people used to think was that dopamine was this, you know, the pleasure chemical, the pleasure neurotransmitter. And it's actually, it's involved in a lot of different things. You know, pleasure, motivation, sexual desire, movement. It's involved in a lot of things um, all, throughout, all throughout the body. And, but people primarily thought it was um, associated with pleasure. So over the years, though, what scientists noticed is that there were really odd times when they would find spikes in dopamine. For example, in times of high stress, they would notice a spike in dopamine. Well, that's a negative event. Why is there dopamine if it's supposed to be a pleasure chemical? Or people with um, PTSD, they would hear gunfire, and then there would suddenly be like a spike in dopamine. So they started thinking, well, that, well maybe it's not all about pleasure. You know? So they started um, this one researcher, um, John Solomon. What he did was he was studying animals in different states of um, dopamine levels. So he took some of the animals and depleted their levels of dopamine artificially, and the other ones he left them the same. So they found this food that um, these animals really liked. They found something that they really liked, and they created two conditions. One was, was low, um, you know, low, one was high. So they had a small pile of food, so it was like low reward, and then they had a big pile of food, which was high reward. So the, the low reward situation was right in front of them. And the high reward was behind this little fence that they had to jump over. And so they found that the animals that were depleted of dopamine they would eat the low reward food, but they would always just skip the high reward. They would go without food because they're like, oh my god, I don't want to climb that wall. Forget it, it's not worth it. They would just forego the thing that they found pleasurable just because they were not motivated to do so. So what they determined then is that the primary function of dopamine is not just pleasure, but it's motivation. So often they overlap, but they are not the same thing. So in the brain, pleasure and motivation are actually two separate things. This is really important when you think about designing a program. So you're trying to um, get a group of people to change their behavior. So what's the first thing you do? What do they like? And then you try to throw things that they like at them, and, and you expect them to change their behavior. Well, it doesn't actually work that way. So let's map this out a little bit. So you have pleasure and you have motivation on two sides, two different things. Very often they overlap. And when they do overlap, that's actually what you want. So the point at which pleasure and motivation overlap, that's like the awesome spot. So if you're designing a program or a game or anything, any kind of incentive program, if you can combine things that people like and with things that they're motivated in in that context, that's exactly where you want to be. That's the sweet spot right there. However, there are other things that motivate people too. What about distressing events? So if, if you're in the middle of a street and there's a car coming at you, you're going to be pretty motivated to get out of the way because you don't want to get killed. Okay? So that also overlaps with motivation. And your motivation there is, you know, not death. Okay? You want to stay alive. So can you use that to motivate people to change their behavior? Yeah, you can. Um, some, some video games, it's that, that fight or flight, you know, your, the dopamine is spiked because you're motivated to stay alive in the game. But when you're talking about real life, if you're, if you're um, holding like threats and shame and guilt over people, which is a distressing event, you may motivate them to change their behavior in, in one instance, but they're not going to keep coming back to that situation in order to, you know, not die or not get, you know, their pay cut or whatever. Um, so when it comes to wanting people to come to you to engage in behaviors that you want, you want to overlap the pleasure and motivation together. So let's do an example of learning. So if you guys remember last year, I talked about the five ways to increase your intelligence. And all of these things, so seeking novelty, challenging yourself, thinking creatively, doing things the hard way, and networking, all of these things combined can increase your food intelligence. Now, one of the things that these things all have in common, they all raise dopamine. They all motivate you to keep going even when things are tough. So when you have this like magical combination going on, you get in this positive feedback loop of 
things are difficult, but I'm challenged, and it's something new, so I'm excited. You know, novelty triggers dopamine, and so there's, there's things to explore, and you're, you're constantly motivated to keep going to the next level. Even when things are so hard, you cannot even believe that you could possibly do it, you want to keep going because you get into that positive feedback loop. So what we found now is that the single most important factor in learning is motivation. Now, you can still learn things without being motivated by it. You will still make those paired associations. You can, you can learn math by being miserable, by sitting in class and, and you know, doing, you know, figuring out problems and doing memorization. But you're going to learn better if you're actually motivated by the thing that you're learning. So, I mean, this is the whole reason why we design games for education. Why is that? Because kids are learning, you know, at this level. We want them to be learning at this level. So what are we going to do? We're going to create an environment in which they're motivated to learn. Now, not every child is going to be motivated by games or stickers or, you know, outside things that you give to them. You know, the example that I gave, my client, he was motivated by getting more work to do, and he liked that intrinsic, you know, feeling of accomplishing things and going on to the next level. So when we look at designing um, any kind of situation, when you want to get that positive feedback loop. You want to get people, like, stuck in that sweet spot, and they don't want to move from there. Because what you're doing is you're developing patterns of behavior. And it's, it's harder to break a pattern than it is to, you know, start something new. So if you get them... In this, in this positive feedback loop, you're going to get a higher rate of success no matter what you're doing. So the take-home message of all of this here is that the things that motivate an audience to change your behavior are not always what you would expect. So you should not assume, you should investigate. So just a, a quick little story about myself. You know, through, through my own work looking at, you know, what underlies motivation, I started thinking about what motivates me. You know, what are the things that I like? Okay, I love coffee, I like sleeping. Um, yeah, coffee and sleeping are my two favorite things. <laughs> I love science, okay? So when, when someone is trying to entice me to change my behavior or, you know, put a new job in front of me, what's going to motivate me to take, you know, a position or something like that? If they give me free coffee, is that going to make me take a very difficult job? No. If they offer me a lot of money, probably not. Um, if they say you can work three days a week and have a couple days off so you can just sleep, I probably still won't take that job because... What is the one thing about me that will make me forego all those other things and jump over the Great Wall of China in order to get to? So what motivates me is finding problems, identifying solutions, getting people to change their behavior in order to implement those solutions, and making their lives better. And I realize that that is really what gets me going. So as long as I can do that, I'm happy and I'm in that sweet spot. So hopefully you take something away from all of this and you change your lives, and that will help me stay motivated. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that. Thanks, Andrea.